Uh, uh, Melton, all through uh, your discussions, you hammer away at uh, uh, two things. Uh, the theories of Adam Smith on the free market and of Thomas Jefferson on central power. One thing that troubled me a little bit about your discussions was that it seemed to me that you were a little bit uh, the way uh, psychoanalysts used to talk about Freud, that uh, you believed they had given us the word and that even though 200 years had gone by, uh, it was still the word, uh, that the circumstances had not changed the meaning in any way. Are you that fixed about their ideas? There's a great difference between principles and the application of principles. The application of a principle has to take account of circumstances. But the principles that explain how it is that an automobile operates are no different from the principles that explain how a horse and buggy operated or how a bow and arrow operated. The principles that Adam Smith, uh, Smith enunciated the philosophy that Thomas Jefferson enunciated are every bit as valid today as they were then. But the circumstances are different, and therefore the application is in many cases very different. In addition, there has been a great deal of work and study and scholarly activity that has gone on since then. We know a great deal more about the way in which an economy works than Adam Smith knew. He was wrong in many individual details of his theory. But his overall vision, his conception of how it was that without any central body planning it, millions of people could coordinate their activities in a way that was mutually beneficial to all of them. That central concept is every bit as valid today as it was then, and indeed, we have more reason to be confident in it now than he had because we've had 200 years more experience to observe how it works. All right, well, then, then let, let's go back to Jefferson. Fine. Uh, you say, cut the functions of central government to the basic functions advocated by Jefferson, which was what? Defense against foreign enemies, preserve order at home, and mediate our disputes. Now, can we do that in the complicated, the complex world we live in today without getting into very serious trouble? Suppose we look at the activities of government in the complex world of today and ask, to what extent has the growth of government arisen because of those complexities? And the answer is very little indeed. What is the area of government that has grown most rapidly? The taking of money from some people and the giving of it to others. The transfer area, HEW, a budget one and a half times as large as a whole defense budget. That's the area where government has grown. Now in that area, the way in which technology has entered has not been by making certain functions of government necessary, but by making it possible for government to do things they couldn't have done before. Without the modern computers, without modern uh, methods of communication and transportation, it would be utterly impossible to administer the kind of a big government we have now. So I would say that the relation between technology and government has been that technology has made possible big government in many areas, but has not required it. I know, I believe, I say I know, I, th I think I know, but I'll say I believe that um, you felt, you blamed the government for the Great Depression of 1929 through 1933. And of course, uh, you had to blame FDR for all he did. But most people uh, feel that he saved this uh, free economy of ours. Given the catastrophe of the Great Depression, there is no doubt in my mind that emergency government measures were necessary. The government had made a mess. Not FDR's government, it was government that preceded him, although it was mainly the Federal Reserve System which really wasn't subject to election. But once FDR came in, he did two very different kinds of things. Well, had the government made a mess by what it did, or by, uh, but, but by what it didn't do? By what it did, by its monetary policies, which forced and produced a sharp decline in the total quantity of money. It was a mismanagement of the monetary apparatus. If there had been no Federal Reserve System, in my opinion, there would not have been a Great Depression at that time. But given that the Depression had occurred, and it was a catastrophe of an almost unimaginable kind, I do not fault at all. Indeed, on the contrary, I commend Roosevelt for some of the emergency measures he took. They obviously weren't of the best. 
but they were emergency measures, and you had an emergency, and you had to deal with them. And the emergency measures, such as relief programs, even the WPA, which was a make-work program, these served a very important function. He also served a very important function by giving people confidence in themselves. His great speech about the only thing we have to fear is fear itself was certainly a, a very important element in restoring confidence to the public at large. But he went much beyond that. He also started to change, under public pressure, the kind of government system we had. If you go beyond the emergency measures to the what he regarded as the reform measures, things like NRA and AAA, which were declared unconstitutional, but then from there on to the Social Security system, to the... Uh, uh, All right, well, take, take the Social Security system for a minute. Uh, the people wanted that. They wanted that protection. Not they were frightened. They Not wanted welfare. Not at all. Well, you said pressure. Who Pressure from whom? Pressure from people who were expressing what they thought the public ought to have. There was no widespread public demand for Social Security programs. The demand no, for the... No demand for welfare with 13 million oh, people Oh, there was a demand employed. for welfare and assistance. I was separating out the emergency measures from the permanent measures. Social Security in the first 10 years of its existence helped almost no one and only took in money. Very few people qualified for benefits. It wasn't an emergency measure. It was a long-term measure. And it had to be sold to the American people, primarily by the group of reformers, intellectuals, new dealers, the people associated with, with uh, FDR. The Social Security is one of the most misleading programs. It has been sold as an insurance program. It's not an insurance program. It's a program which combines a bad tax a flat tax on wages up to a maximum with a very inequitable and uneven system of giving benefits under which some people get much, some people get little. So that Social Security... Well, would, you, would you now abolish Social Security? I would not go back on any of the commitments that the government has made, but I would certainly reform Social Security in a way that would end in its ultimate elimination. Well, you're not afraid, then, of the free market under any circumstances, <clears throat> where cooperation, which you find necessary, or which you believe always comes, fails to come, where competition becomes so fierce and becomes f very frequently corrupt, and where it or where it becomes stupid. Take, for example, what's happening in today's market, the conglomerates, which have, have been seizing up all sorts of... We, we happen to live in, live in a hotel that's run by a conglomerate. Why should ITT, for example, run a hotel? And how are you going to how are you going to stop that? Well, first place, once again, without government, without some once government again, intervention. it's government measures that have uh, promoted the conglomerates. The only the major reason we have conglomerates is because they are a very effective way to get around a whole batch of tax legislation. Let me ask a different question: Who is more effective? by government regulations, by government controls. I suppose, I thought I was supposed to ask the questions. <laughs> you, but they, I was warned that you might turn these uh, on me. But tell me, who is, uh, uh, who's more affected? The big fella who can deal with it, who can have a separate department to handle the red tape, or the poor fella? Well, the big fella can always take care of himself under any system. Right, and this therefore you want a system which gives the big fella the least advantage. And the system under which he can get government to help him out gives him the most advantage, not the least. You say, am I afraid of, uh, of greed, of lack of cooperation? Of course. But we always have to compare the real with the real. What are the real alternatives? And if we look at the record of history, if we go back to the 19th century, which everybody always points to as the era of the robber baron who strode around the land and, and uh, uh, ground the poor under his heel, what do we find? the greatest outpouring of voluntary charitable activity in the history of the world. This university, this University of Chicago is an example. It was founded by contributions by John D. Rockefeller and other people. The colleges and universities throughout the Midwest. If you go back and ask when was the Red Cross founded, when was the Salvation Army founded, when were the Boy Scouts founded, you'll discover all of that came during the 19th century in the era of, of, of unregulated, rapacious capitalism. No. Well, now, I'd like to go back for a minute to the question of conglomerates. Uh, granted that what you say, that the government policies, uh, concentration of uh, central government, if you will, or whatever you want to call it, are responsible for the growth of conglomerates. What would we, what should you do about them now? No should doubt. government try to undo them? 
Or should anybody try to undo them? No. Or should you just let them fail? What would you you do? should let them fail, of course. I am strongly opposed to government bailing any of them out. You should let them fail. Uh, the best things you can do, in my opinion, are first to have complete free trade so you can have conglomerates in other countries compete with conglomerates in this country. We may have only two or three automobile companies, now, when but there's Toyota, there's Volkswagen. Competition from abroad is effective, but in the second place. And when you say complete free trade, you mean all over the world? No, sir, right. I mean the United States all by itself, unilaterally, should eliminate all trade barriers. We would be better off if all the other countries did the same. What do you think would happen if we just did it, though? I think we'd be very much better off, and a lot of others would then follow our example. That's what happened in the 19th century when Great Britain in 1846 completely removed unilaterally all trade barriers. So that uh, I'm you not... You don't think this country would be flooded with, with uh, goods of all kinds from all over the world, maybe cheaper, and that we what wouldn't would, have what great would, unemployment what would the people? Country? What would the people who sold us goods do with their money? They, they'd get dollars. What would they do with the dollars? Eat them? If they want to send us goods and take dollars in return, we're delighted to have them. No. No, that's not a problem as long as you have a free exchange rate because we cannot export without importing. We cannot import without exporting. You would not have a reduction in employment. What you would have would be a different pattern of employment. You'd have more employment in export industries and less employment in those industries that compete with imports. But go back to conglomerates, Larry, for a moment. I just want to ask a very different kind of a question. Conglomerates are not very attractive. I would much rather have a lot of small enterprises. But there's all the difference in the world between a private conglomerate and a government conglomerate. In general, the government conglomerate can get money from you without your agreeing to give it to them. You and I pay for Amtrak and for the postal deficit, whether we use the services of Amtrak or the postal deficit or not. I don't pay your conglomerate unless I rent one of their apartments. I get something for my money. So bad as private conglomerates are, they're less bad than one of the alternatives. Well, suppose I suppose I agree with almost everything you say and say it would be wonderful if, if we were starting from scratch. If you agree with almost everything I say, you're a unique human being. I didn't say I, I do. I don't say I do agree, but I said suppose I agree for the sake of argument. Um, we can't start from scratch. No. How do we undo what we have? Uh, how do we undo what we have done? That's the hardest. How would you undo it? Not me. That's, you. that's the hardest problem, and I agree. That is the real sick, uh, question. How do we get from where we are to where we want to go? And we can't get there overnight. We cannot get there by simply eliminating the things that should not have been done. As in the case of Social Security, we have it, and we've got to live up to our obligations. So we do have to develop a series of policies which will enable us gradually to move from where we are to where we want to be. The first and most important step, in my opinion, is to stop moving in the wrong direction. Milton, uh, you, you said uh, a few minutes ago that throughout the free world, the public is coming to recognize the danger of big government and is taking steps to control it. But how, uh, with the example of, of what freedom does before them, how do you explain the new countries that have been coming up, uh, all going in the direction of dictatorship. The, the intellectual climate of opinion has an enormous influence on what happens. And the popular intellectual attitude within the free countries, for the poor countries, has been that they have to have centralized government. And that has served the interests of small elite groups within those countries. In one backward country after another, what has happened as they've gotten their freedom, supposedly, from colonial rule, you've had a small elite take over. And they have run that country for their own benefit and at the expense of the poor. It's a tragedy of the modern era. Change the climate of opinion in the major countries. As the climate of opinion is changing, as the philosophy, the attitude, what's being taught at the universities is different. And you will see that these other countries, these backward countries, will follow it. And there, are some, there is some evidence that way. If you look at the countries where the backward countries which are doing best for themselves, they are places like Hong Kong, like Singapore, like Taiwan, like Korea. They're not free countries in our sense no, of the term. Not. But they have lar much larger elements of freedom, much greater scope for individual initiative than do uh, many of the other countries of the world which have gone much farther in the communist, centralized, controlled direction. 